So we're ready to go? Yep, yep, we are. Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, we're here in our continuing series on people that you, sh you should know of Marathon County. Uh, today we're featuring George Cook from Unity. Uh, ben Clark uh, will be uh, telling a little bit about this, super this Marathon County supervisor from Unity on the far, um, I shouldn't say on the far, on the western side of Marathon County. So with that, we will turn it over to Ben and uh, we'll learn a little bit about George Cook and the uh, Marathon County Board as well as the, a little bit of the life of Unity. So here we are, Ben. Hello. Yeah, thank you for everyone for joining us. Um, as, as Gary mentioned, our, our theme has been um, uh, people you should know. Um, and, and with this one, we're kind of cheating a little bit. Um, we are going to be talking about George Cook, who is a certainly a very important figure um, in the history of Marathon County in his own right. But it, I'm also getting along with him, um, the rest of the Cook family and the community of unity, which we don't really maybe talk about as much. Um, you know, in, in many cases. Uh, so this is a good opportunity to do that and I'm excited to share that. Um, we'll start with Alfred Cook, um, who is actually the, the father of George and, and some of the other, um, the, the, the Cook family here. So um, Alfred Cook came here in the 1870s, very early in the, the history of this area. Um, and he ends up becoming a, very much an important figure um, in a lot of ways. Um, he had a store in what's going to become Unity. He's, he certainly has you know, the farm there. Um, he's going to be you know, the, the chairman for the town of Brighton um, and, and, and ultimately is going to be very important and, and influential in, in getting his vision um, for Marathon County, which is specifically, or specifically for the town of Unity um, or the village of Unity uh, getting uh, incorporated as a village, which was not something that everybody in that area necessarily desired. Um, there's sort of competing um, sort of ideas of what the, the future should be. But he, he is certainly one of those figures, um, ends up uh, serving as the postmaster um, and as, as the, actually is elected to the Wisconsin Assembly in an interesting sort of moment where, you know, put this in context, the, the Cooks were by and large stalwart Republicans. And by that, I mean capital S, capital R. Um, at this point in time in central Wisconsin, the political divide was less Democrat versus Republican. It was what wing of the Republican Party did you belong to? So um, there was the La Follette progressives, and then there were the stalwarts. Um, and, and certainly Cook uh, fell on the latter category. And um, in this case, uh, he objected to Mr. Vander Cook uh, from Stratford, um, who was on the other divide. He was a, a progressive La Follette Republican, um, who after being elected, um, got a sort of patronage job in, in Cook's eyes and ended up leaving and working, you know, down in the Capitol, uh, you know, not in the community that he lived and was supposed to represent. Um, and so he decided to run against him. He actually ran as an independent under the Democrat ticket. Um, and he ended up winning that election by a very slim margin of, margin of four votes, um, but certainly did that. And then after having proved his point, he decided not to run again when his term was up. Um, so kind of an interesting um, kind of precedent there. Uh, Cook is interesting, Alfred Cook specifically here, is interesting because a lot of the things that he is doing here, um, serving you know, in local representation as the postmaster, going on to you know, statewide representation, is something that, uh, a good many of his children, um, at least three of uh, his four sons, um, are going to go into represent you know their communities in various ways and other things, as we'll see. Um, but yeah, we should talk about unity because, as I said, he is kind of important in in developing this. Now, unity, if you're if you're not familiar with the western edge of the county, you might not know of uh, you know of unity. It's not necessarily the the population center um, that, that maybe other places are. But it is, it is certainly a significant place um, and, and was at this point. Um, Unity kind of early on in the 1870s gets established, um, from what I understand, partially in, in, uh, due to the influx of Civil War veterans who, who chose it as their location. But not long after that, the railroad goes right along the western edge of the county 
um, called the line there. Um, and so you have communities like Colby and Abbotsford, um, and, and which are, you know, partially in Marathon County, but also partially in Clark County. Um, Dorchester and Spencer are also kind of emerging around that period. And, you know, you could kind of expand this to, to, to include a variety of other, um, you know, communities on other parts, you know, Burnham Wood all the way on the right, uh, on the, um, the eastern side of the county, for example. Um, and to maybe an extent Marshfield, even though Marshfield is a Wood County uh, city, um, it does spill into what we would, you know, the, the county line. And this provides an interesting, you know, situation where if you're living in the town of Spencer, for example, down in the left, you know, the lower left corner here, in the 1880s, 1890s, Yes, you're a Spencerite. You're, you, you, you might be from that area. That's the community that you're part of. But you probably were not thinking of yourself as being more in common with the people in Wassa, which is the county seat, compared to Marshfield, which is just right there. So, you know, ultimately we are, this is Marathon County, but the creation of Marathon County as an institution or sort of as a, you know, more than just a line, lines on the, the map um, is something that is... Um, not take, you know, it wasn't, doesn't for taken for granted, like it wasn't inevitable that it was going to happen. And I would argue that the Cooks had a good part in, and specifically George Cook in kind of helping to form that identity. Speaking of George Cook, um, I'm thinking I'm going to start here. Uh, this is him uh, enlisting in the Spanish-American War um, in 1898. He enlisted into the Wisconsin National Guard in 1898 in response to the conflict as they needed volunteers and he's going to go on and serve. Now, it's interesting because he enlists um, in um, not Company G of Wassa, the 3rd Regiment, um, which would have been the Marathon County representation here. Um, and the 3rd Regiment would have been, at one point, you know, about 15, 20 years earlier, um, actually Unity had its own militia company, uh, which would have been in the 3rd Regiment. But they're not in Company G, not Company A in, in Clark County in Nielsville. He actually enlists in Company A of the 2nd Regiment in Marshfield. Now, this isn't necessarily that important in the grand scheme of things, partially because the 2nd and 3rd Regiment um, actually see the same service during the war. They both um, go down to Chickamauga and then end up um, taking part in the occupation of Puerto Rico. But it's also, you know, 3rd, 2nd Regiment, um, it can get kind of confusing. Don't worry about that. The, the interesting thing here, though, is just that, you know, he did serve in a non-Marathon County unit, even though he was living in Marathon County, which, you know, certainly could happen. Um, and I think that that is, is kind of part and parcel with some of the experiences of the people around Unity, for example. Um, his younger brother, Walter, for, you know, as, as an example, Walter ends up serving in the state uh, Senate, um, representing Clark County. Um, even though he had a Unity postal address and that's where he would identify with. So, so they're right on the periphery, certainly the Cooks in the late 1800s, around the turn of the century, um, even, even into, the, in, into the 20th century, you know, their, their identity as being from Marathon County is not necessarily um, taken for granted. Uh, but yeah, so, so George um, comes back in 1899. The war is over very quickly. It's a very one-sided quick war. Um, and then so coming back to Unity. Now, his older brother around this time um, was actually the Justice of the Peace for Unity. Uh, Lewis Cook, um, his older brother, um, has, a, has another career. And ultimately, like we could have, I could have probably picked Lewis uh, to be the, the focus of this too, because also a very influential um, individual. Um, he, he, in the, the 19 aughts until about 1910, when he moves to Wassa, um, is active um, on the county board. Um, he is uh, running his own newspaper and printing service, um, representing the Republican Party and uh, specifically promoting agriculture, the, the Marathon County Register. After he moves to Wassa, he serves in, um, you know, the county clerk for a number of years. Um, he actually, again, uh, kind of like his father, is uh, runs uh, for the state assembly to unseat uh, someone from a political side of things he didn't uh, agree with. Um, in this case, the socialist chef, Herman Marth. Um, We'll talk, you know, different story there. And then he spends about a the last decade of his life um, and, and change as the postmaster for WASA. Um, so another individual. Um, and, and beyond this sort of specifically the government sort of roles that he had as elected officials and things like that, um, he is also going to be involved in agriculture through the, the, the Agricultural Society. Um, this is both uh, George and... Um, and Lewis um, at the state fair um, at the Marathon County booth. Um, 
at this point in, this is 1919, um, at this point, Lewis is the secretary for the Marathon County Agricultural Society, which runs the fair. Um, and, and George is, is going to be involved in this, you know, very much as well as the chairman. Um, I don't know if the specific year he was the chairman, but he was for many of the years in the 19 teens um, for this group, uh, I should say. So there's Louis, or Lewis, I should say, um, and there's George. Um, hopefully you can kind of see that colorization a little bit there. So what are they doing here? Well, this is, this is basically after the fair was done in Marathon County. Um, they would go to all of the, the people who showed, they had the best of the best, and they would collect their produce, and then they would take it down to the state fair and then show it there. And then each of the counties had a booth, and they would be judged and given an award to see who had the best sort of representation of, you know, having the ability to, to, to do agriculture. Um, and in this case, um, in 1919, as well as I think 1916 and either 17 or 18, so three out of the four years there, uh, Marathon County got the first uh, prize. Um, he, uh, George said in 1916 um, that when they left home, um, he said, quote, to, uh, told them uh, at the courthouse to, quote, uh, put up an extra shelf in the courthouse so that we could put up the cup when the minute we got back. Um, so they were, they were pretty confident in their ability um, and the ability of the people of Marathon County. And again, the interesting thing here is it's not just, you know, the individuals who show at the fair. This is Marathon County as an institution, um, which I think is kind of interesting there. Um, the Cook brothers also uh, were, were involved in World War I in a big way. Um, this is a panoramic picture uh, of the draftees uh, in one particular week uh, in, in May of 1918. Um, and yeah, uh, they're in most of these pictures. We have a, quite a few of these panoramic pictures showing them. Um, and and there are, there, there's Louis and George, or Louis and George. Sorry, his name is spelled Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. I think that's the way that he would sometimes, but it's also L-O-U-I-S. So I keep getting those mixed up. Either way, um, yeah, brothers are both here. They're both involved as the, um, uh, on the exemption board of the draft board here for Marathon County as well as serving other patriotic um, sort of, uh, patriotic and civil um, things during the course of the war. Again, kind of a, a period in which the county comes together as an institution to help maintain the war effort and to, to win this war. And the cooks are, are right there um, at the forefront. Speaking of George though, I haven't get back to him here. Um, this is from April of 1914, the year that he was first elected to the uh, county board to represent um, the village of Unity. Um, it's a position that he is going to serve uh, from 1914 until 1965. Um, uh, so it's gonna be, I think, is it, if you do the math here, that's 50, 51 years on the board. Um, as far as I can tell, this is the record for the longest uh, period of service on the, as a supervisor um, at the county board. Um, I don't know if it's been, other, other people have, have taken that uh, sense, but I, I don't get the sense. I didn't go through every single supervisor to see how long they served, but certainly um, he, he deserves um, recognition for his long service on the board. Um, also during this time, um, in 19, I think 1938-39, he becomes the chairman of the financial uh, committee, which is going to be a post that he's going to serve for the next 24, 25 years until about 1963. So not only is he just on the board, he's also, again, as we would expect from, from Mr. Mr. Cook here, um, certainly taking a leadership position as well. Um, while he's on the board, he also picks up another job. Um, in 1918, um, he ends up becoming one, uh, I, think, I think the first, um, I, I kind of got conflicting information here in various sources, but um, the first motor vehicle inspector for the state of Wisconsin. Um, and, and before long, there were two of them that did most of the work. Um, and basically what this meant is, you know, this is very early on in the concept of an automobile. Uh, so they, they needed to figure out, you know, registering and inspecting vehicles. So he would travel all over the state um, to do just that. So he would do, you know, inspections um, and register vehicles. He, you know, gave um, driver's type, uh, license tests and things like that as well. Um, this organization is sort of the, the, the framework for this is going to get um, turned into the state patrol, um, the traffic patrol, um, and then ultimately it's going to be kind of pulled into the, the purview of the Department of Transportation when that gets created. Uh, but this is a job that took uh, George all over the, uh, the, the state, uh, meeting people and, and getting involved in different ways. Um, and it's something that he would, uh, from 1918 until I think he retired in 1948, so about 30 years on the job there as well.
But eventually he, he does retire in 1965. Um, there's some inaccuracies here, like the, for some reason it's crediting that he was here in 1911, that's when he got started. I'm not sure if that's a mistake. Anyway, regardless of whether or not it was 1911 or 1914, and there was a mistake in the article here, um, he does retire in 1965 after more than uh, 50 years on the board. Um, and then in the following year, um, George does pass away at the age of 91. And he leaves a, an interesting legacy um, as someone who was very passionate about serving the community that he belonged to and the wider community of Marathon County and not just, you know, content to sit back and, and you know, keep track of things in unity, although, you know, this is a picture of him um, getting out the vote, uh, you know, attached a school bell to a car and they would drive around unity, getting people aware that it's time to vote. Um, so he was very much active in his local community as well. Um, but as his, his position on the county board is interesting because you know, like I said, he was come from this, this environment of, of the stalwart Republicans. Um, he, he probably was a little bit more fin fiscally conservative than some of his peers on the, the, uh, on the board. But he never really held that against, uh, you know, from everything that I've, I've you know, understand about him, he was not the sort of person who, you know, held grudges as long as people were doing their best and, and working towards, you know, doing what's in the best interest of the communities that they served and, 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 and doing that, you know, it is what it was. Um, whether or not it, he, he agreed with the outcome of, of policy or, or things like that, um, he didn't help hold grudges and he worked to say, you know, all right, well, that's what we need to do. Let's figure out how to make it work, um, which is kind of a, I don't know, it would be kind of refreshing to maybe get back to that in, in some ways. Um, but on the other hand, he also wasn't the sort of person who needed to, if he, if he needed to convince people, apparently, you know, there are stories about how all he needed to do was say out loud at a board meeting, uh, you know, sounds good to me, I think we should do this. And people would just fall in behind him because, you know, this is a guy who had earned the respect of, 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 the, of his peers, um, of the people of the, the community that he served. And, and, you know, rightfully so, he was uh, uh, respected for that. Um, and of course, the other legacy that he leaves behind is his family. Um, these are his, his children, um, uh, the, the, the Cook children. Um, the Cooks were big about um, giving their, their children opportunity to, to learn more, to, to become better educated. So uh, many of his daughters went on to uh, teach uh, schools after going through the normal school. Um, uh, I think Sewell ended up taking on the, county, uh, the, the farm, um, whereas Kelvin uh, went and uh, continued in the, his father and his, his family's, I guess I should say, um, footsteps of being a civil servant and getting involved in government in various capacities. Um, and I bring this up too, I, I just want to take this opportunity to, to thank the Cook family, um, particularly Sharon Cook, who has been very helpful about putting this together, um, and to, to donate, um, you know, whether it's scanned, uh, you know, uh, pictures, a lot of these pictures that I, I included here a month ago, we didn't have, I just kind of reached out to her and was, she was very thankful, uh, you know, very graciously sent me a bunch of these images that I could, you know, represent different areas of her, her grandfather. Um, Sharon is, is Kelvin's uh, daughter. Um, uh, but also just the Cook family in general for, 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 um, trusting us with their, their materials for their, their family. Um, and it allows us to do this, you know, have a really great, um, story that we can tell and, and tell it visually, um, as well as having the materials to, to document, you know, the story and the importance of um, this, this wonderful family uh, for our community. So that's it uh, for me um, today about the cooks. Um, I just kind of say next week, uh, we do not have, um, uh, well, we're skipping a week, we're taking um, uh, Thanksgiving off uh, but we will be back on um, the following week with Gary, who's going to be telling us about um, uh, Louis Marchetti. Um, so that'll be on the 3rd um, of December. <laughs>